You're right. You cannot do a tax projection without software, but the rest of us can. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Perfect RIA Podcast. I am your co-host, Matthew Jarvis, and with me, as usual, the man, the myth, the legend, Micah Shalansky. Micah, how are you, my friend? Jarvis, I am doing fantastic. Another wonderful day in Alaska, uh, enjoying as much as the summer as it quickly comes to an end as we possibly can. I have to, uh, a little confession for our listeners here. We always, of course, lead with a, an intro quote of some time, and Mike and I giggle like little children every time we come up with these intro quotes. But oddly enough, they're like real things that come up, right? We'll meet with advisors and they'll say, well, hey, you can't, what tax projection software to use? What financial planning software to use? Uh, none. <gasps> what, what, do you, what do you mean none? In fact, I've even had, Mike, I've had um, E&O providers get upset about this. I've had... Uh, we talked once with the lead search just because I was curious how it worked. They right. got upset about this. I've talked to custodians about this and they're like, wow, that's just, this just can't be. I don't know. Where does it say in the Investment Act of 1940 or 1941 that you need software since it was written before computers? Where software. does it say in the CFP exam? Uh, and this is not that you and I are, what's it called, a Luddite? You're like, we're technology adverse. I think mm -hmm. we're pretty much on the cutting edge of technology in our practices. But there's this idea that somehow the software can take the place of being a really good financial planner. And, and if it could, we would all be out of jobs already, but it, but it can't. It can't, at least not yet. And that's why we're here. Well, that's the same thing just like any other industry that we see out there, right? It's not necessarily about the tools at your disposal. It's about the craftsmen behind the tools mm -hmm. that really sets everything apart. And that's the exact same thing with financial planning. And yes. you know what? A really great craftsman doesn't need nearly as elaborate of a tool set in order to do the job as, as say, I would. So if I was going to do a wood project or something like that, I would want to go buy all the fancy tools and all this other stuff, et cetera. But then I get this master carpenter that helped do a lot of customization on our house. And man, he could just do a ton. He would just go to his, his it would say, hey, build this, you know, X, Y, Z thing. And he'd go in there. He'd walk out with two tools and he'd build the whole thing. I'm like, yep. how the hell did you do it? Because he knows what he's doing. He knows it's in side and out. And that's the same place that we need to get to and be stay at with the financial planning. And when we rely too much on software for an answer, Jarvis, here's my issue with it. You don't know when it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at best, and we'll take your, your, your master craftsman example, just a step further at best. What is it? Maybe add five or 10%, maybe 15%. Like, so I, I love to dirt bike. I go to dirt bike races just for fun. And when the pros are there, the people that are literally paid to do this, they have like zero modifications on their bike, Micah. They're just like, mm -hmm. they, they're, they roll them off the showroom. They adjust yep. the handlebars to fit them. I've got probably $5,000 of accessories on my $10,000 dirt bike. And I'm, I'm still not even one one hundredth of them. They don't bother mm -hmm. with any of that because it's all talent. Now, again, software, let's just talk about tax projections. Software can help. It can speed the process, but you have to know what's going on. You have to understand it and how to communicate it for the client. Otherwise, all you're doing is generating more noise. It's like you've set a yeah. white noise machine on your desk in a client meeting. You've turned it up to full blast and you're surprised when the clients are confused and they can't understand what's going on. Well, Jeff, I'm going to push back on that and say yeah, software, please, please. Uh, your comment that you just made was software can help with the situation. And I'm going to say software might be able to help with it, right? Or really emphasis is the, the potential that's going to be there, but it's that's not an point. always thing. Right mm -hmm. now, I'm not saying never use software, but I'm saying you really need to understand what's going into that to come up with the correct answer. Now, I could give some very good examples of tax software that was out there that gives some wrong information yeah. when it's said and done. Um, because at the end of the day, guess what? It is a person programming software, right? At the end of the day, I am a person giving tax advice and alas, I am prone to being able to make mistakes. So software is nice as a, maybe a cross check, but I cannot take it as gospel that it's coming down. This information is correct. And when we do, that's where I've seen advisors mm -hmm. make this ton of mistake. No, no, no. Look at this report. It says A, B, and C. And I'm like, that report's wrong. Now, maybe it's user error that, that, that created it. I'm not blaming the software per se, but the advisor couldn't see a glaring mm -hmm. error in a tax projection. Man, you're setting yourself up for failure. That's why you have to understand what goes into it. And you should be able to do a tax projection without any software because mm -hmm. that's how you're going to find the mistakes. Yeah, but that's a, that's a great point. The other thing the software does is it is the siren song of complexity. And I, I think I've told this story before on the podcast, but I, it bears repeating here. I, I was at a presentation. I, I think it was Mark Anthony, actually. It was at a, at a workshop and he calls a volunteer of the audience. I, 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 let's say he calls me just to make the story easy. Uh, and at the time, my kids were young. He says, well, Jarvis, uh, you have daughters. When will one of your daughters, your oldest daughter, Alice, when will she get married? Mark, I have no idea when she'll get married. Well, we need a date. Jarvis, we need a, we need a date. All right, Mark, again, I have no idea. Who's to tell you what? I looked it up. The average person in America uh, marries at age 26. So we're going to say she marries at 26. 
Mark, I don't see where you're going here. Well, we need an exact date, actually, Jarvis. What day, what year is that? So he factors out, that'd be the year 2032, whatever the year is. You know, the average person gets married on June 16th. So we're going to say your daughter's going to get married June 16th, 2032. Mark, you can't know that. No, no, no. And I'll tell you what, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is for you right now, and this is what every financial planner does. What I'm going to do is tell you what the weather is going to be like on June 16th, mm -hmm. 2032. So you know what equipment to be saving up for today. Now, you listen to that's the most absurd example ever. Of course, you right. don't know when my daughter's going to get married. Of course, you don't know a day of the year. Of course, you know the weather's going to be. But that's what this projection software does, Micah, right? They say, like, hey, what's the optimal asset location optimization for a $100,000 distribution in the year 2043 at this tax rate? It's, it's stuff that's impossible to know. Yes. And so we create this false sense of accuracy, and we're drawn to all this complexity that at the end of the day, the client just throws out because it makes no sense to them. It just feels utterly absurd. It's, it's fee justification. It's playing office in the greatest extent right here because you're, you're playing behind a keyboard and you're not actually adding value to a client. So versus just ragging on software because yeah, sometimes right, that's it's right. fun to do. But let's go into actually action items, right? And why did we make a pivot? Now, I'm also going to be super clear. There's times that I'm going to hit the whole button on a client says, you know what? I need to go play with some software in order to get you a yes. correct answer because it is more complex. And there's a lot of things that I need to double check. But Jarvis, there's a lot of times that I don't need to jump into software. I can simply look at my RTS tax guide and I can give really accurate tax advice and tax information to, to clients because I understand where these numbers are coming from. So we got to be able to have both of uh -huh. these. Yeah, because, uh, and again, let's let's take your average client, let's take 90% of your clients. What tax advice, what tax planning do we need to do? Well, a lot of times we're just trying, it boils down to do I do I realize taxable events today or do I try to defer them till tomorrow? I mean, really at the end of the day, yep. that's what like all tax planning comes down to. There's some nuances there, but the majority of it comes down to that. So like you said, with the RTS tax cut, I can look, okay, are we going to be in the same higher or lower tax rate in the future, given any kind of reasonable projections? Now, again, do I need to Monte Carlo that to see if, you know, what the time value of money is going to be? No, 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 I can just look, hey, you're going to retire in five years. Your income is going to go from this to this. The tax rates are currently scheduled to go from this to this. Let's start pulling some levers. Yeah, that's really important to start looking at all of these things, right? And as we start going through it, Jarvis, let's kind of talk about what a tax projection, when is it helpful yes. and when is it not helpful, right? Now, a tax projection is, is a value add. So we're going to play well, the sure. same value add rules that we have. A value add needs to be personal. What does that mean? It needs to be unique to that client's mm -hmm. situation. If I send out a letter to all of my clients that says, hey, tax planning is really important, you should think about this. That's not a value add. No. That's not personal to them. Mm -hmm. That's not helpful to them. So it needs to be personal about their own situation. So we'll talk about what that's going to be. But I need to talk about their income. I need to talk about the future changes to their taxes in there. Uh, what levels could they do? And I need to talk about action items, right? That's mm -hmm. the second thing a value add needs to have is actionable items. Now, I do want to also say that sometimes being clear that there's no action is an action item. I'm saying yes. great news. This has already been tended to, and it doesn't make sense for you to do X, Y, and Z because of this. And so no action is needed. That's still value, right? That's our dishwasher rule. We're getting mm -hmm. credit for the things that we've reviewed with a client. But if my value adds don't have those two things, but not personal, mm -hmm. unique information to the client, and it's not actionable information, that's not a value add. Yeah. So let's, let's take that really specific. So if we're looking at a client or prospect's tax return, now again, Ideally, we have all pages of the tax return, the schedule, the cover letter, the estimated payment sheets, the entire kit and caboodle end to end that we got from the prospect and client. Uh, and if you're not getting those successfully, we'll talk about that in just a minute. So we're looking at that. How can we deliver personalized advice right away? Well, a super easy one is to look at their taxable income and figure out what tax rate they're in. Right? So I can look at their taxable income. I can look at the RTS tax guide and I can say, oh, you're in a 24% tax bracket. Now that may seem like a, like a worthless fact, like, Oh, and you're six foot two, but they knew they were six foot two. What they did not know, I promise you is that they were in a 24% tax bracket. What they also didn't know is how much room was left in that bracket, right? To do Roth conversions or capital gains harvesting. So while that may seem like kind of a, Oh, that's a, that's a no duh thing. It's not on the tax return. Not that the client would ever read the tax return. And it's just, it's not something they know. So I'm the first person, including their tax repair or CPA or whoever, who said, hey, just wanted to let you know, like, here's how your tax return works. Mike, in fact, you even sort of walk them through the return from an income and deduction standpoint. 
I do. I really like to explain it to the clients, right? I like to show them their 1040. I spend it around so that they can see it and say, hey, great news. This is your wages. This is how much money you had. This is how much we took from retirement accounts. This is your Roth conversion. This is your Social Security. Great news. You see not, not all of your Social Security is taxable. This is where we did the transfer of your TSP. Great news. It's reported to the IRS because the IRS is nosy and they want to see it, but you're going to see it's non-taxable, right? This all adds up to your gross income. From that, we get to take our deductions. Man, you get a great standard deduction in here. Here's why it's beneficial for you for 26000 This is your taxable income. Mr. and Mrs. Client, this number determines what ta- how much taxes you pay. All the other numbers are just good numbers to mm-hmm. know, but this is the important one because they've never looked at their taxable income number. They always no. look at their AGI, right, because that's what's get printed everywhere. This number determines how much taxes you're going to pay, right? So based on this, you're in an X tax bracket. And I kind of walk through that. This is how much money you totally paid in taxes. And with a prospect, that's an eye opener right there, Mm -hmm. right? Because they've only seen, did I pay or did I get a refund? Do I owe a thousand bucks? Am I getting $2,000 back? That's all they see in taxes. And when I look at the returns, it's last year you paid $38,000 in income taxes. Nope, Micah. Um, I don't know where you got that number from, but I got a I got a refund last year of like eight hundred dollars. Uh, um, yep, yep, you sure did because you overpaid the IRS. You actually paid them thirty eight thousand five hundred dollars, but you only owed thirty eight thousand dollars. So that's the reason you got that five hundred dollar refund, right? And kind of walking through these examples with the client, and it's a little eye opening. I don't expect them to be a tax expert, Jarvis, mm, but no. I want them to get the ideas. And while I'm planting those seeds, I quickly want to connect it to why is this important. And I'll say, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Client, you know, one of the reasons I like to go through this with you is, number one, it's your money. I need you to make sure you understand what's happening with it and you're not not overpaying the IRS. But the second part of this is we got to start looking at this from a 10-year timeline and not one year at a time. Mm Because if we take this $38,000 that you're going to pay in taxes this last year, if I take it by 10 years, that's $380,000 in the next 10 years you're stacked up to pay the IRS. What I want to see is how do we get that lower? Even mm-hmm. if it's only to 320000 that's still $60,000 of savings in the next 10 years. That's why this is important and what we need to look at. Mike, I'm glad you shared that example, right? Because that that's what we call back of the napkin math, right? That wasn't, yes. you didn't need your 12B2 calculator. You didn't need to do time value of money, right? You're taking, here's what your tax bill is. Now, uh, sorry, cor- correction. I, I, I use a 12C. This is oh, a Polish me. guy, reverse Polish notation. I don't, I'm, this, this B stuff is weird. <laughs> That's right. That's pretty funny. But but it doesn't for the illustration for the client, because right, our goal is to provide clarity to complex subjects to clients when taxes are a complex subject, and then to get them to take action. So if I spend my time saying, hey, you know, what, it's actually been 383,000. Uh, unless you take Social Security, then it's going to be 293,000. The client's going to get lost. That. So at that point, I'm adding complexity. I'm not removing complexity. And the more complexity there are, the less likely we are to take action. Right. So you've made it very simple. Hey, we're talking about three hundred and eighty thousand dollars plus minus. It's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Right. It's way more than they ever thought. They thought they were going to get eight hundred dollars back every year. And then you're saying, hey, by making small adjustments, we can potentially save sixty thousand dollars in taxes over the next 10 years. Is that action that you want to take? Well, yeah, I'd love to save sixty thousand over the next 10 years. And so this is why, again, we're, and I always spent the first half of the episode beating up on software. The software is not going to communicate that to clients. They're going mm-hmm. to get lost in the noise and then no action is going to happen. So this is the thing, whether you use a software report, whether you just use the tax churn, I like to have, a, like I call it the slow reveal with our advisors, Jarvis, is where I'm showing the tax churn, but I'm kind of covering up the rest of it. And I'm going down one line at a time when I can't or revealing it, or at least having my pen on the line that we're talking about. Because I want them to come along the journey with me and not get ahead of the game. And sometimes with software reports, that's really what can happen is that you can be presenting on software and it can be 15 pages and you want to talk about all of these other details that goes on there and you're not bringing the client with you along the journey. So it's really important to do. All right. So we talked about that. We kind of beat that up a little bit. Jarvis, let me talk before we talk about what's in our tax projections. Let's do a couple of hard stops that we have in our office. When will we not give a tax projection to a client? No, no, no. That's a great, that's a great question, right? So the easy not is if I don't have a tax return. Ideally, if I don't have the current year's tax return. Now, now that might float just a little bit because maybe they're on extension or they haven't gotten it or something going on. Sure. But if I don't have uh, this year or at worst last year's tax projection, assuming there's not a lot of change going on, I, I just can't. It would all be guesswork. In fact, I really can't do much, Mike, of any financial planning at all without 
that it had to be like not knowing what their expenses are or not knowing how much is in their IRA accounts, right? It's, it's, well, I'm not saying it's borderline reckless. It, it's straight up reckless. So I need to have a tax Ooh. return and, and I need to know if there's been any major changes for the year. Ooh, all right. This is going to be a fun question coming up now. Now, this is a total edge case, but this is real life that happened to me. I had a client come in that hadn't filed taxes in six or seven years. And so, oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So then that way I had no tax return from her. Uh, now, the first thing I said is, is going forward. I was like, if we work together, and I've actually had two of these clients now that I think about it. Uh, if we work together, the number one requirement will be getting your taxes caught up within the next 18 months. Yes. It's not going to happen overnight. I totally get that. But we will get your taxes caught up and filed over the next 18 months. And if you're not willing to commit to that, I cannot work with you as a financial planner. Yeah. And, and both of them were on the same page of saying, yes, I want to do this. There's just been all these good reasons to why they haven't done it. I says, okay, no problem, but we need to tackle this. So from that edge case, it was, is the client willing to fix issues, willing to, to do these things when I don't have those returns, right? And for that one, it did make it super complicated because one was a business. So that was fun oh, um, wow. and really complex in order to figure out what, like, like how much, and there was one of their questions, like how much should we save for taxes this year? And I'm missing the last five years of tax returns right? Depreciation's messed up. I have no idea what expenses are inside of there. It's like, it's, that's not an easy question to answer. So I had oh, to punt wow. on that one. I had to say, okay, great. What's your income? At least be just 40%, right? We're going to have, because they're in Alaska, we have no state income tax. We have self-employment yep. tax. Plus we have federal taxes. Like, All right. We're going to start withholding 40% of anything that goes to your bank account. And, and that's the way we have a place to start. Now that's not a tax projection. That's, Hey, I need to bank some money mm -hmm. because I know you're going to owe taxes, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. And let's call that out also for what it is, right? So you're going to have outlier clients and that's kind of a yes. fascinating one. Like that'll be a fun one to dissect in an episode or just to sit down and kind of nerd out right. on like, how do you handle that? But that's one, two of your, of two. all of your clients. Yeah. Two. So you're, yeah. you're going to have those. Right. And so that's where sometimes we get stuck and we say, well, I've got this, this outlier, or I imagine this outlier, like, okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's great. We're going to have to tackle one that we'll, we'll really sit down and nerd out on that. But for the rest of your clients, mm -hmm. right on issue. So Mike, so you've got a client hasn't filed in six years. That's obviously a big project to work on and on a general basis a prospect comes in a, a longtime client how how does it work in those situations so this is the one we always get the client's tax returns now that's just our policy we ask for the the client's tax returns so most of the time we get it on our initial meetings with clients sometimes they only give us a couple of pages because we've had a, a failure to communicate the importance of all of the pages but we always get our clients tax returns mm -hmm. and and so i need to have their tax returns jarvis also their full tax return to include depreciation schedule so two hard stops that i have i'm these are off the top of my head so forgive me i'm sure there's more but two hard stops in our team that we will not do a tax projection for a client without this data depreciation mm -hmm. schedule if we're selling rental property, number one, and number two is inheritances. I've had mm -hmm. so many clients get miscommunication with when they're receiving an inheritance about what type of money they're receiving. Is it taxable, is it not taxable, et cetera? And I've, I've kicked my own self in the butt several times because the client said it was all tax-free money because the estate planning attorney said it was tax-free yeah. money and it was all IRA inheritance. Um, and so we don't do any of those. Without the actual statements, without the actual depreciation schedule, those are hard stops in our office. We will not do a tax projection without that because we've been burned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Well, and so... I think for, for advisors, let's talk just a minute about advisors that are struggling to get those tax returns. We have to acknowledge on the first hand that for the client, this is not a pleasant process, right? It's like when your doctor says you need one more medical exam, you're, you're not thinking, well, giddy, what I'd love to have is a colonoscopy. Like that sounds like a lot of fun, right? And, and so your taxes, they think, all right, I've already taken care of it. It's not a pleasant thing. I have a tax person. It's very personal. I've never shared my tax data with anybody. So we've got to understand that we're overcoming those hurdles. But Mike, to your points earlier, we overcome those hurdles, not by beating them now, not by shaming them, not by saying like, hey, this is what we have to do by demonstrating value. Mr. and Mrs. Client, probably your single biggest expense in retirement will be the IRS. In fact, not probably it will be your biggest single expense in retirement will be the IRS. And Mr. and Mrs. Client, I noticed that you've got about a million dollars in retirement accounts. The IRS is waiting, not so patiently, to take somewhere between about zero and about half, maybe even more of that retirement account. My job is to get that closer to the zero than to the half. And the way we do that is by looking at your tax return and making plans based on that. So to do that, awesome. what I'll need is this year's tax return and last year's tax return. You can mail it to us. You can drop it by the office. You can send us a PDF. You can even call your tax repair. Now they'll make you sign a form, but they can send it over to me. Which one of those sounds easiest to you? And Micah, with that, we have almost never an issue. Almost never. 
Yeah, I don't get any issues at all because tax planning is such an important part of what we do and we demonstrate that to clients. Um, so yeah, got to get those tax returns, really important. Also current income statements. I'm a huge fan of that one. So in January of every year, mm. and one of the things in our communication, I think it's February, actually, my apology, in February of every year, and one of our communications when we're getting ready for surge is we let clients know, hey, especially all of our retirees, you probably received an annuity adjustment letter. If you received a pay change, oh, sure, sure. get us that information and we're going to review it in our spring surge appointment. And what I'm looking for when I'm reviewing that, I'm not really running a, a full tax projection on all of my clients because most of them are on autopilot. I am looking for things that have changed inside mm -hmm. of that. Their tax withholding went from $600 to $20. Okay, we have a problem this year, right? I, I mean, there, there's going to be an underpayment more than likely. So I love to get those annuity change letters, those paste up change letters, et cetera, on all of our clients so we can see, hey, is everything shaping up the way it should be? Because again, we've had issues with that. So most of your clients are on autopilot once you get to this point, but I would get all of their information that you can. And I would say, okay, you know, we kind of have three groups, if you will. Uh, well, really two groups. You have workers and your retirees. And sure. with workers, we have kind of fixed income workers and we have kind of variable income workers. And then with retirees, you know, pretty simple. We can kind of streamline that tax analysis that needs for them. So you kind of have those three broad categories that you need to put your clients in. And then that's how you kind of set up your tax projections for those. No, that makes a lot of sense, right? So you're trying to group them because we also need to have efficiency or effectiveness in this process, mm -hmm. right? So the tax planning, essential part of your practice, but if you're having to spend 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, three hours, five hours on each one, you'll never get to them, which is, I think, reason, Micah, most clients, excuse me, most advisors don't get to tax planning yep. is that they're so busy playing office or they've found the most complicated way possible. We were talking to an advisor the other day who likes to do his tax projections through three different pieces of software. Okay, well, you'll never get done with those. You just won't. There just aren't enough hours to get done with those. You've got to find that was a way their complaint. to. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, that, that was, that their was complaint their complaint. Yeah. Was that they're not? They don't have time to get these all done. But they argued so vehemently that they had to use three different yep. pieces of software. Um, and it's like, hey, but you have this great idea. But if you can never implement it and never get the information to clients, is it really that great of an idea? Yeah. Yeah, same with all financial planning, right? No matter how beautiful and nuanced, and is it five point this percent or twelve point this? If the client doesn't implement, right? If you if you know their risk score out to the 100th decimal point, but it doesn't change how they act, oh boy, we really haven't gained anything. Mike, I can say one other thing I really love when I'm doing tax projections, and uh, this this isn't almost isn't fair to mention because so few advisors can do this, which is of course getting the 8821 set up with the IRS. Now, yes. for advisors working with retirement tax services, uh, they can get that set up for your clients, and that's where uh, we can get a lot of things that we couldn't normally get. Like, how many clients do you know what their Social Security withholdings are? Now, you probably know quite a few, Micah, but I would say most advisors don't know what's being withheld for taxes. In fact, most people are having zero taxes withheld from the Social Security because it's an extra form. Well, what ends up happening is now you have to overtax everything else. Now, it all pencils out the same in the end, but there's a lot of um, optics going on here, right? So we get the 1099 from Social Security. We can see that they're not withholding. We can talk to the client. Hey, let's have some withholding. We want every bucket of money to pay its own taxes. Right. So there's all these pieces that come up when we have more data and we know how to effectively work through that data. Oh, boy, Jerry, we're not going to get to the meat of this podcast because there's so many little side <laughs> channels we're going to run down. But I'm going to say, you know, you, you mentioned those optics, but I just got to hit on those. It's not the same. Mathematically, you can argue with me, knock yourself out. It's not the same when you have one pot of money paying all of the taxes like an IRA and you have pensions and Social Security withholding zero in taxes. Why is it not the same? Because the optics to the client is the retirement accounts are not performing. They're going mm -hmm. down in value. They're losing money. They're not doing all this. We're like, yeah, but half the money coming out of the retirement accounts for taxes because we don't have it to the, from these other pots. And you could say it's all the same, but in reality wise, the client views the lens differently. The second optic I want to give to that, I want to make sure a client knows every stream of income is taxable and we got to have it being withheld in taxes. Now, some streams of income aren't taxable. I get that. But the mindset I want to put in with the client is anytime you get income, the question you need to ask is how much is taxable? The second question is you should be calling Micah, right? This is the thing I want all of my clients to be thinking about. And that's the reason I want taxes withheld from all sources of their income. Yeah, completely. I, we run into this all the time when industry commentators, right? Things like, where do you withhold the fees, right? Do you take the, your AUM fees for Roth account off of a non-qualified account? Sure, on paper, that makes perfect sense until mm -hmm. that drags down the performance and the client's always saying, hey, why is my non-qualified account always performing so poorly? And again, you might say, well, hey, on paper, that all pencils out the same, but we're not dealing with paper. We're dealing with humans, right? So the best laid tax plan, if not implemented, really has no value, Mike, no value at all. 
So Jarvis, let's kind of jump in this a little bit uh, on tax yeah. projections. One of the things that I want to see in a tax projection, number one, are they on track for their current income plus or minus a thousand bucks, right? That's my benchmark yeah. for yeah. my clients, plus or minus a thousand dollars. Now I have some that says, hey, I don't want to owe the IRS. Well, then I need to make sure they're on the plus side of, of getting a refund, right? Um, yeah, and most don't, by the way, most people don't yes. want to owe the IRS in April, even if they know it's a tax-free loan and I get all that, most people want to get money back in April. So Jarvis, the way I've solved this with some of my clients that have a little bit more complex situation and we don't, but they don't massively want to overpay is say, great news. We have a tax account set up at Schwab and that's going to pay all the taxes at the end of the year. And it does. And, and yep. they don't feel like they're writing the check for it. It still comes out of their account. I mean, we've just earmarked that money in a separate account. Uh, but that, that that's a way they feel all of that pain relief that's mm -hmm. going to be there. Our great news, if you owe money, your investment should always pay for themselves. And if we have a lot of investment gains at the end of the year that generate a tax bill, we're going to make sure Schwab sends you that money out of your accounts so it'll pay your taxes. So there's ways to, to work with that. But I agree. Mm -hmm. Most clients don't want to owe any money at the end of the year. So I want to know, are they on track? How much do they know or not? I want to know what their bracket is, and I want to know what their bracket 2026 is and at retirement time. And do we need to do anything between now and then? Any mm -hmm. Roth conversions. I want to know what their uh, Medicare income limits are going to be, where are we at, and I want to know what their RMDs are going to be, mm -hmm. and is that going to push them into a higher schedule, right? Those basic, I think there's like four things, those basic things right there will give you a solid tax projection on 99% of your clients. Yeah. And, and the outliers would be, and these are things you also want to have noted in your CRM. We're going to talk about having your team do some of these things in just a second, right? The outliers would be, hey, they have a major expense coming up that's going to create a taxable event, right? Hey, in, in year seven, they want to pull yep. out $300,000 to buy a second home. Okay. Or pay off their mortgage. Great. Or they have an incredible unrealized gain that we're trying to diversify out of, right? So those are going to exist. And what's great is by streamlining this process, I can note those in there. Great. We need to get $300,000 of tax-free money over the next however many years. Great, here's how we're gonna do Roth conversions to get there. Or here's how much we're gonna do each year to unwind this big uh, unrealized gain. Now, Micah, to do this, and here's where advisors get stuck as well. They say, great, I'm gonna spend this afternoon doing tax planning for all my clients. Well, one, this afternoon is not enough time. I don't care how fast you, you will, are, even if, you're, even if you're Micah Shalansky, you're not gonna do all your clients' tax planning in one afternoon. So Does you need to be like realistic. Yeah, it does, actually, now that we think about it. You need to be realistic on the time frame, but then you also need to say, great, how do I speed this process? If my plan is, I'm gonna open up one client at a time, I'm gonna look through their folder, I'm gonna see if their tax return's there, I'm gonna open their tax return, I'm gonna get distracted by a few things, you'll never get to the end, right? This is where you'll have your team, and if you don't have a team, right, call a Blake, get a virtual assistant, have them go through, create a spreadsheet of all your clients and just have them list where, what tax return do we have on file? And anyone that we don't have the current year tax return on file, we either need to have a reason, they're on extension, or we need to be tracking that down. As an advisor, I am never the one that's saying, hey, why don't we have the 2022 tax return? It's already in the CRM, it's already noted, it's on the spreadsheet. So that when I spend that time doing tax planning, I can look, oh, here's all the clients we have the tax plans or the tax returns for, here's where I'm gonna start. And I'm gonna double check with the team, where are we at on getting these other returns? Yeah, really, really important to to do that. Um, and, you know, having that process kind of written down, right? Jarvis, one of the things that I'd say in your inside of your process, and I love that idea of putting all your clients' information in one giant Excel spreadsheet if you can't do it inside of the CRM. Yes. It's a great starting place, so you can do kind of the more things at mass. And then what you want to do is you want to have a process for how do you fix little things? Example, client's going to owe money. You need to have more taxes withheld. Great. What's your strategy for that? Is it estimated tax payments? What's a guide mm -hmm. on how to make estimated tax payments? RTS has a great guide on that mm -hmm. that you can get. Is it you're going to withhold more from Social Security? We'll hold more from a pension. We'll hold more from an IRA. IRAs are the easy button because we can help control that. If you got to fill out a W-4 or W-4P, what's the simple way to do that? And I will say a lot of preparers overcomplicate the living hell out of these W-4s, in my opinion. It's super simple for me on a W-4. I do a tax projection for a client. The client owes, let's say, an extra $2,000, and we're going to have it withheld from one pension to make my life easy. I'm going to look at their current withholdings. Let's say their current withholdings are married, filing jointly. Probably should have been married filing a single or single mm -hmm. filing, whatever. So I'm going to leave it as married, and let's say there's you know, X amount of time left in the year. I'm going to divide that out. And I'm just going to say for an extra withholding, we're going to have X dollar amount for the rest of the year and submit the W-4 off with that. Don't try to fill the damn thing out um, mm -hmm. because every time you do it, it's all based on that income is the only income that family is getting and it screws everything up. So leave it where, however it's filed as, and then put an extra dollar amount in there and call it a day. Yeah. And so look, we solve this enormous problem, which Again, on paper, it may not seem enormous, but the clients, and let's say the client's annoyed every year that they owe, they owe $4,000 every year. Uh, great. 
we, this doesn't have to be elaborate. To your point, Mike, great, let's add $350 withholding to each monthly distribution uh, from the pension, from Social Security, and let's let's rock and roll. Of course, Social Security, we can't do dollar amounts. We have to do percentages. That's right. why everybody's at 22%. That's a story for another podcast, right? But these levers we can do, these things that might seem trivial, make a big difference in the client's life. And the one thing I want to add on this one too, let's say we have a yeah, working please. client um, that has some variable income, right? I think these are the hardest ones, in my opinion, to, to plan for. Yes. They get bonuses, income goes up and down. And it's like, man, I did a tax projection in March and we were solid, but your income changed. You never told me about it. And you made an extra 70 grand and you're upset that you owe more in taxes, right? And so what we've done is we failed to communicate with a client of what needs to happen. So what I do with my clients with variable income, why I go over the tax return with them is I then pull up their pay stuff and be like, hey, see this federal tax withholding number mm -hmm. right here? This needs to be 24% of this number, their gross pay, right? Their taxable pay. And I circle those on their pay stub. When you get a pay stub, when you get a bonus, you need to look at this and times it by 24% or whatever bracket they're in. Sure. And it needs to equal this dollar amount. If not, you are underpaying in taxes and we need to make an estimated tax payment. It is okay to push that burden back on the client mm -hmm. because they're the ones with this information. It's our job to empower them on how to take action. That was a specified advice, unique advice to them, right? And actionable to them, right? It doesn't mean I have to do the action for this value add. Mm -hmm. This value add is pretty simple. It's great news. Here's your information. Here's how much taxes need to be withheld as a percent. Do the math every time you get your bonus check and let's make sure it's withheld. Yeah, and that's why we always preface those with based on the information you provided us, based on what we know mm -hmm. so far this year, here's what we recommend doing. And again, for your variable income clients, hey, if something changes, let us know, right? And obviously we have to be more attuned to that because we can't do recharacterizations of Roths anymore, at least not in a material way. So there are a couple of clients that will wait till later in the year, but there are also things that are just solid tax planning all the time. If you're in a higher tax rate, we probably want to stuff as much money as we can in qualified accounts all the time. And then we want to convert as much as we can stomach all the time, right? So there's some basic stuff that we're going to want to do. We'll fine tune it. Yes, but we're going to, we're making the client aware of these things and we're taking action on them. I love it. Jervis, speaking of action on our long-winded podcast today, action, thank you guys yeah. for your, your patience on this one. We get a little excited about it. This podcast is all about action items. And you know, Jarvis, as this is the, the big thing that's going to be here, I'm going to say is number one, first action item is they should kick off and attend the RTS tax summit. And yes. if you missed it for this year, I don't, I'm so sorry you were under a rock all year and didn't hear about it. Uh, but for next year, 2024, make sure you get signed up, but it was September 27th through the 29th. This is really going to be an in-person way. We're bringing in, uh, RTS is bringing in a rock star set of people, panelists to talk about how they do tax planning, how it works with individual clients mm -hmm. and some really good presenters. I'm excited to hear. You can attend that virtually, or you can still get tickets to attend it in person, but we will be there. Uh, action item number two, Micah, this is something that has come up. You and I do a lot of coaching of advisors through our Invictus program. And a lot of times we talk to advisors who aren't aware of what's possible. In fact, we, we tease on this episode about like, hey, Micah, you don't understand. I do real financial plan. I do real tax plan. I do real whatever. But it's because they just haven't seen what's possible. Same goes for tax planning. Same goes for how your practices run, your profitability, these different measurements. So the practice analyzer on the Perfect RA podcast is a great way, albeit I will confess a painful way to see where your practice is today versus where we are coaching top level practices at. And by the way, if there's not a gap on yours, if your numbers come out above where the benchmark is, let us know because we'd love to chat with you on the podcast. If you're below, uh, let us know, reach out to Lifestyle at the Perfect RA because that's what we do. Like we literally just bridge the gap between where you're at and where your practice could be. I love it. Action item number three is Ooh. a lot of this work that we talked about needs to be done, not just from you, but from your team, your assistant. Yes. If you don't have an assistant yet, especially a personal assistant, really yes. kind of take things off of your plate, allow you to focus on what you need to do, you are missing out. Easy way to get them is we partner with Belay as a virtual assistant company versus you doing the hiring process uh, yourself. You can reach out to them and they'll take care of it. If you want to know more about that, and you should, make sure you text RIA to 55123. That's RIA to 55123. One, two, three, and you're going to get their free ebook on the best way to use virtual assistants. Whether you decide to hire them or not, text mm -hmm. it anyways, get more information on how to use your assistants more effectively. Yeah, there really just is almost no limit on what you can use a virtual assistant for. And then the time that that frees up, right? So we think like, oh, that's a low value task. Yes, but that frees my time up for high value tasks. Mike, in fact, just this week, Zach, who's been my Blay EA for some time now, booked a dirt bike course for some of our family, dirt bike class for some of our family members during the RTS tax summit. My wife, some friends and family of yours and mine are going to be taking a private dirt bike class that he got set up. So Very cool. uh, you can put those people to use in great ways. Mike, I think parting just thought for all of our listeners is 
uh, taxes can be intimidating, but it's an area of incredible value for your clients. And so it's not one to dismiss and say, hey, that's like, that's too much work. I can't do it. It's one to say, wow, what an opportunity is ahead of me. Let me jump in. So jump into tax planning. Listen to this episode again. Join the RTS Tax Conference. And Micah, until next time, happy planning. Happy planning. Information designed to change lives. Financial planning can make you thrive. Start today, don't think twice.